welcome back to the webinar. Nice, got a lot of folks joining in. So we just started today. We are joined by Joel from Browserless, and whether you're just getting started with web scraping or whatever, I think it's an important topic to be familiar of with headless browsers. So that's what we're going to talk about today, and uh, we're going to answer your live questions as well. This is also being recorded for folks who are not watching it live. You can watch it later on. Wow, 100 people already. Um, yeah. Nice. Then, all right. Cool. Uh, let us know where you're joining from as well. Appreciate it. So many folks joining in. But uh, yeah, uh, let's get started. So Joel, maybe you'd like to give us a quick intro and then I believe you have a nice presentation for us to share. In the meantime, I'll be taking some notes as well and uh, asking you some questions after you're done. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Kanal. Yeah, my name is Joel, uh, Joel Griffith. I run Browserless.io. I started Browserless.io about six years ago now, which has been some time. So um, originally uh, it was just a way to service and run Puppeteer. And that was, this was before Playwright. This was before all these other libraries that came out. At the time, only Selenium was really like the biggest supported library. And um, as great as Selenium is, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Selenium, it does have its shortcomings and pitfalls and you know some head scratchers. And so Puppeteer came out. Uh, and there was really no great way to like run it in a scalable way. You kind of had to do everything yourself. And so that's where browserless kind of started from was being able to like operationalize and run headless Chrome at scale. So, uh, that's the genesis of the company. Um, it's a cloud platform. You can connect, you can, you know, run workloads on it, um, do all sorts of fun stuff. So scraping, testing, asset generation, all that, um, it's a very interesting space. It's a very interesting set of challenges that come with it. Even if you get everything right, there's still things that go wrong. Um, so, you know, be ready for, for that. Headless browser automation is always a fun, uh, yeah, fun, a fun thing to try to, you know, wrangle up. So anyways, I'm going to jump into a, a quick presentation. So just full disclaimer, this was the keynote we did for our first conference a few weeks ago. Um, it talks a bit about some of the cool things you can do with, you know, headless Chrome with Puppeteer that you may not be familiar with um, or may have thought about. Um, we see a lot of stuff. There's always interesting cases people trying to do, and we're trying to make life easier for people that have to, you know, use these tools for day-to-day -day jobs. Um, so be prepared, you know, take notes, ask questions at the very end. Um, I've sat with this and done this a long time. So uh, I want to say I have a pretty good depth of experience, but there's always something new that comes up and I would love to hear, you know, what you guys have about it um, and what, you know, works and what doesn't work. So let me share my screen with y'all. Cool. So again, this was from the browser conference a few, a few weeks back. So you'll see some of the, some of that in here, but anyways, um, yeah, so prior to, you know, doing this, I was an engineer at Elasticsearch. I worked at at and I've worked at Wyden Kennedy, which is a creative ad agency. All of these businesses at some level used a headless browser, whether it was for automated testing, whether it was for scraping, whether it was for uh, asset generation. And what I mean by asset generation is PDFs, screenshots, you know, data from scraping or data aggregation. Uh, Prior to starting Browserless, I wrote one of the first drivers that Headless Chrome used over WebSockets. It's called Navalia, and this was back in 2017. Puppeteer came out and was a much better, a much better library top to bottom. And so now I just run Browserless IO, and uh, that's me. Yep. And you can see me on the screen. So that's about it. Um, so yeah, kind of like what I said in the beginning, you know, we do operations with Headless Chrome. We run the platform, you do what you want with it. So we see every use case ever from the good to the bad. I think one of our first customers was trying to do like automated gambling at some point. So um, not, not a great thing, but you know, not the worst that's out there. But anyways, we've seen a lot of stuff. Um, I'm always of the mindset that things could and should be better and it's a journey not a destination so you're always trying to improve in lieu of getting to a better place but you're never ever there so you're always trying to see what could be better you know what things could be easier be more descriptive that sort of thing um and so anyways this talk is all about you know what we see coming in the future how things are transforming obviously there's been a proliferation of new libraries which is 
always great to see. We love to see new libraries. We love to see people thinking out of the box, writing libraries for particular use cases, always great. Just because you get much more like good feedback from dev tools, all that stuff. So um, yeah, let's just uh, jump into it. Um, and then, yeah, the, the theme of this kind of webinar is what if, so those of you familiar with, you know, the Marvel series, what if this is kind of a play on that to a degree, like what if we could go back and we could rethink a few different things with how we, you know, structure stuff and automate that. So that is the theme of the talk. So, uh, yeah, the first, what if I'd like to introduce is this concept that we call hybrid automation. So let's, let's think of a, a case, you know, where <clears throat> you need to automate some workflow writing like fail proof, you know, fault tolerant code when you're automating a browser is, is just difficult. Put the on top of that, if you're having to automate something that involves user credentials, it becomes even harder because not, not only do you have to worry about websites breaking, DOM breakages, you know, network outages, that sort of thing. Now you got to handle security problems at the same time, right? SOC compliances, all that. Um, so managing that aspect is difficult managing the headless browser is difficult um the thing that makes this even more fun and complicated is that you know there's legislature laws being enacted all around the world you know think of gdpr all that stuff where storing this data is not necessarily a great thing it's kind of a liability so the way i kind of think of data and i i'm hoping more and more companies start thinking of it this way as well as data is, is a liability the fact that you have access to data is uh, you know, can be a good thing if we can differentiate or can help you with your business, but it is a live time. People are trusting with your data and you can't always, you know, just treat it however you'd like. So, you know, my favorite example is this. If you've ever maybe applied for a home loan in like the United States or had to do some sort of automated banking thing, you might have gotten this screen at some point where, you know, this platform needed you to authenticate so they could log you in. Um, you know, I don't really like giving people my username and I really don't like password and believe it or not, a lot of this is in violation of banking terms and agreements. So, you know, if you have a, a bank and you do business with them, they don't want you to share your user information and password because that's a security, you know, vulnerability essentially. So, you know, back to my point, like that's a liability right now. You've got a third party or you're running something that uses this. It's a third party. They have your username and passwords. It violates agreements for a lot of banks. Um, this works typically if it's just username and password, but once you throw in like multi-factor authentication into this, everything kind of goes out the window. So think of like text, email, and even um, like Google is a good example. They'll have you open an app to authenticate or you know multi-factor that. Um, you know, so this is this is a thing. I don't think it's going to go anyway anytime soon. Um, you know, businesses like Plaid are built on this multi-billion dollar businesses. And so the fact that this is around today means it's probably not going to go away. But, you know, I think we could do better. Um, and to be honest, a lot of these things are just honey pots. So insert Winnie the Pooh gif, you know, with hackers, everybody else trying to, you know, penetrate their systems to get data. So. How do we avoid Winnie the Pooh? Well, the future is is hybrid. So what do I mean by that? If you, What if you didn't need to collect this information? What if you could just let users authenticate with like a live stream of a headless browser and then your code just sets everything up and then proceeds to run after you've logged in? So think of it in two steps, like your puppeteer code starts a browser, creates a stream, sends that stream to the user. The user can log in. Once they've logged in, then they can then your code can take up from there. So what does that look like? This is kind of like a pretty, pretty narrow piece of code that kind of talks about that or shows, demonstrates that a little bit more, um, again, in code. So, you know, we're using Puppeteer here. If you haven't used Puppeteer, I'm sorry, this is gonna be a, a you're gonna be diving in the deep end. Puppeteer does work pretty easily. You can connect, which is on line six, to a remote browser instance, and that's kind of how browserless works. Or you can launch Chrome locally. You can create a new page. And, you know, in this example, I'm going to navigate to, to Gmail. Let's say that we have this secret live URL 
So this is something that's actually coming in browserless as a way to generate this and, and give to your users and so that they can actually get a live stream of that browser. And um, so here I'm just logging it on line 13 just to kind of demonstrate, you know, what that looks like. But so you send that to your user, they log in. At some point, you know, I have a, um, a little async function that's awaiting for an event to happen, but it could be a page load. It could be when, you know, your code detects that something is on the page that it needs, anything to proceed with the actual automation part. This is kind of what that looks like. So on the left side, you'll see a live stream of the browser. I have dev tools open on the right, just to kind of illustrate, this is what the DOM looks like. Um, for those of you that don't know what the DOM is, this is the document object model. And you can see that there's not very much going on in the page. <clears throat> That's because this is just a Canvas stream. So we're literally streaming a, a Canvas, you know, video to the user's browser. They can click, they can type all that same stuff. On this example, I logged in with my Gmail account and, you know, on Gmail it says, hey, you know, check your phone. So in this example, when I recorded this, I was able to pull my phone up, authenticate, and then it'll proceed on here in just a second. Once that's done, boom, logged in. So my code could kick off from there now that I'm logged into Gmail. So happy to talk about this at the end because there's a lot to unpack here, um, but just kind of want to introduce the topic, kind of start thinking about it. You know, the nice thing about this is that, um, you know, you're not storing user credentials. No, nowhere in my code did I ask for a username and password. Nowhere did that get stored. I just give them, give them, them being the end user, a screen to operate on. And they were able to, you know, complete the login step from there and then code can kick off after that and do whatever it needs to do. So, yeah, I mean, just to kind of recap, you know, we don't collect sensitive information. Users are free to use whatever tools they want for multi-factor authentication. They could use, you know, their authy tokens. They could use, you know, temporary tokens, pretty much everything, you know, locally, and it would still work as, as normal. Um, and then the nice thing about this is if you need to like reload this page again in the future sometime, you can always save the cookies from that page, start a new browser with those cookies applied, and you should be you know back into that user session again without having to bother them. Um, there's some really cool things about this that I think are gonna be interesting in the years coming. Um, the first is that you can whitelist parts of that website, right? Since Puppeteer is, essentially managing that headless instance, you can, you know, remove elements from the DOM, you can inject, you know, headers and like little helpers to kind of get through like, we need you to click here, we need you to sign in here. So it just makes it a much more curated experience. So instead of the user being like, why am I logging into my bank, you could, you know, have little helpers that essentially like instruct them to move forward. All of that, you know, through the power of puppeteers APIs. So pretty much everything you can even remove stuff that you don't want them to like navigate away or moves to a different page you know everything is kind of on open for you know you to do whatever you'd like all right so that's the first thing is the you know headless automation hybrid automation but the second what if i want to say is debugging so debugging today with headless chrome is pretty pretty brittle sometimes of an experience, especially when you run this in the cloud or, you know, you're operationalizing it and running it, um, you know, and the stuff we get for that is, is good when you're developing, you know, most documentation I've read says, you know, set headless to false so you can see the browser as it's doing its thing. Um, you can even say dead, you know, dev tools, turn those on so you can watch dev tools and the browser as it's doing its thing locally. Um, and, you know, you can console log, stuff or possibly have a debugger, you know, in your IDE, but, um, you know, there's better options here. <laughs> Chrome has a really sophisticated set of debugger tools and we're not using those at all. We're kind of just, you know, bringing our own thing to the table. So instead of using this really nice, sophisticated piece of technology, we're essentially just on a surfboard with a uh, parachute or a umbrella <laughs> trying to pull us along. Um, anyways, so let me introduce you to this thing that Chrome has internally. If you start Chrome with a debugging port, and here I'm using 9222, Chrome lets you remotely see what's going on. So if you use this API, the JSON API, in this session here, I'm having um, one page that's um, actually loading the same page, but you get these really nice 
uh, this really nice JSON manifest of, you know, all the open tabs, where they are, the URLs, the titles, et cetera. Clicking on the DevTools front end URL, you get this really nice remote debugging experience. So this, this is a browser that's running remotely from my machine when I screenshotted this. You can see it's a little different than what you normally see. The browser window on this is a little different than the orientation of my own window. So that's why you kind of get this um, windowed experience on the left side. But on the right side, you get all of your debugging tools. So it's almost like you're debugging things locally, but this browser is on separate architecture, separate network, all that. And But I'm able to retrieve it and, and view it. This opens up the whole set of tools. If you know how to use this, this is great. You can even debug things in production if you wanted or watch them as they're running in production on a V. VPC or VM or even on a host service, we have this in browsers as well. You can remotely watch your sessions as they're running. Um, you can click, you can type even, you can interact with that. It's kind of similar to the hybrid automation what we had earlier. And so all that stuff is mirrored back and forth. Um, breakpoints work, all that stuff. So you can you know do conditional breakpoints. Um, we, we actually took this to another level and we built a uh, live REPL. So if you go to chrome.browsers.io, you'll get a TypeScript editor on one side. And when you run it, you'll see what the browser is doing and you get dev tools on the bottom as well. Um, it's pretty great. We use it every day. I use it pretty much throughout my day um, just because we'll get snippets of code that aren't working and people need help. And so I'll just immediately go throw it in the browser and be like, oh, look, this network request failed or, you know, that site isn't reachable in this IP range. Um, you can see everything that's going. So instead of like trying to do console logs, all that, like this is just a much better experience. It's so good, in fact, that you can load the remote debugger in a remote debugger and it'll just, it, it works. Um, but I'm not sure if that's really useful, but it was a funny thing that <laughs> kind of happened when I was getting ready for this is a little bit of a yo dog meme there. Um, yeah, so that's debugging. So we talked about hybrid automation. We talked about debugging. The next topic, this one's really, really kind of new and novel still, is what I call multi-tenant Chrome. So typically what happens uh, in most deployments I've seen is people will have one browser process running per one piece of code running with it. So as we all know, Chrome loves its memory, loves its RAM, CPU, all that. And so anytime you spawn multiple Chrome processes, they're all going to try to grab as much RAM and CPU as they can and as they need. And, uh, you know, here's a screenshot of top running on a remote instance. You can see Chrome is just grabbing a ton of CPU usage, one process. Um, and this is pretty good, you know, if you're just running one at a time. It, but, you know, for most projects, you need to run a lot at a time. And so having Chrome essentially use all the available resources is not a scalable solution. This really comes from the fact that Chrome is built for users, really, and not for running in an automatic fashion. It's cool, you can, but at the end of the day, Chrome is a user land tool. It's not a development tool. So anytime it's up and running, it thinks it's going to be the only instance of Chrome running. Well, that's pretty broad and kind of naive for me to say, but it that's typically how most of us interact with Chrome. I don't have multiple instances of Chrome running as a user. I usually just have one Chrome process running versus you know, 10, 20. Um, Chrome also will spawn child processes to help with rendering, all that. And so if you look in your activity monitor, your terminal, whatever, you'll see that there's usually like a parent Chrome process and then a bunch of child processes for that one instance of Chrome. So it's a lot like tools like Nginx, if people have used Nginx or other you know, tools where they'll spawn child processes to handle you know, requests or whatever it is. What if we could do something a little different here? What if we could have multiple clients connected to the same Chrome instance and have our web server that's acting as like a middleman in between and know a little bit more about what's going on so we can multi-tenant Chrome. So in this example that I want to kind of illustrate is we'll have a script that shows what Puppeteer does and what we're going to sort of man in the middle to make it think it's the only instance connected. Um, and, you know, Chrome today essentially 
operates like it's the only, or sorry, Puppeteer. Puppeteer today or any library really operates like it's the only thing, only client connected to Chrome. And so when it starts and it connects, it says, give me your pages. And the browser just gives back all the pages that are running. So if you think about having multiple Puppeteer clients connected to one browser instance, that doesn't work because then they start to see each other sessions. This is akin to like a database query where you say, hey, select all my users and the database just gives it back. Usually you don't want to do that if you're not you know, wanting to do multi-tenancy like that. So what if instead we have a service in between? So I'm going to use browser list is because that's, you know, where I'm from. But instead of Puppeteer going directly to Chrome, let's have a service in the middle that knows how to handle multiple clients connected. So Puppeteer will typically say, you know, give me pages. We're going to funnel that through a web service. The web service says, hey, give them their pages. Chrome's going to say, okay, here's here's the four pages I've got running right now. Well, this web service knows that, you know, Puppeteer wants all the pages, but it sh shouldn't get all the pages. It's one client. It should only get the pages that it created. And so we're going to filter those four pages just to the one. So I call this a CDP firewall. CDP is the Chrome DevTools protocol. That's how Puppeteer works. Playwright under the hood works the same way as well. Um, we can do a lot of stuff actually with this type of a workflow where we have multiple clients connected to the same browser process. For instance, we can force them to be in incognito, which means that they can't see each other's caches or cookies. We can though, let them use the same cache amongst multiple browser, browser objects to multiple clients. What that does is it lets, you know, big sites like CNN or other, you know, Reddit too is another kind of famous heavier site. This will let them reuse caches across. So that means your sessions, if, if you have multiple clients doing similar workloads and going to similar sites, they all get a little faster because Chrome will hydrate its own cache. The other thing that this does, it's a nice side effect, is it kind of removes management code from the application. So management code being like, oh, you can only have so many browsers connected. You can only have so many you know, tabs open. We can do all that filtering on the web service side versus having to do it on like the application code or your scripts. Because we're doing this in CDP, it means nobody can get around it. So once you have like a CDP middle layer, there's no way to get deeper into Chrome than that. CDP is the, you know, DevTools works over CDP. Obviously these libraries work over CDP. So once you have something that filters CDP messages and kind of like injects the right things into them, there's no way to get around that. That's kind of like the lowest level you can go. A little bit about this, and this is kind of a topic I've been starting to think a little bit more about is sort of separating like application code or business logic code from like management code. The reason that you'd want to do this is obviously it's a clean separation of concerns. You have code that's worried about, you know, just operationalizing Chrome and then code that's just worried about, I need to get something out of Chrome. Uh, this means that you're not like, having wires crossed at the end of the day. So if you can remove all your management code to one layer and all of your other application code to another layer, you're not going to have instances where, you know, one session overrules the other and causes issues. Um, this also obviates the need for things like puppeteer cluster or like pools of browsers just because you don't need those tools anymore. This just kind of works as the way to obviate them. So what this means is we get a much better like throughput experience. Chrome, since Chrome likes to be on its own and by itself, that can still happen. So you can think of one Chrome pro one top level Chrome process per VM or machine. We've did done some testing in this, and you can get roughly about two times the amount of throughput and use about twenty percent less resources than you know running multiple instances of Chrome. The nice thing about this is like once Chrome is up and running for a little bit you get cached assets. So things just kind of become faster and faster as time goes on. Um, the reason I don't show you code examples for this is because it's pretty insane the amount of like CD filtering filtering you have to do. So for instance, our like little CDP firewall for this new feature is several thousand lines of code. And that's because we intercept every message, check from a list of dictionaries, you know, what this message means. Does it, is it something that we need to filter? Okay, if it is something we need to filter, then how do we filter that? So it's a pretty complex piece of um, technology to do this. 
So yeah, those are the big, the big concepts I wanted to share. So the first is hybrid sessions, which means, you know, having code that starts something, have a live stream to the end user, and then have code that kicks off from there and, and completes the automation. You can also use Chrome's built-in debugger for remote debugging. And that's something I just haven't seen many people use. And I think more people should be aware about it and its existence. And the final thought is, you know, we can multiplex Chrome, get a really good speed boost by having multiple clients connected to one browser object versus having each client with its own browser instance attached to it. Just helps a ton. So anyways, that's what I've got. But I'm here to answer any and all questions. I have experience with a lot of different things. So if you have general questions, if you have questions about this and want to know more about it, happy to answer those. Um, yeah, this is a, a fabulous topic. Again, love to talk about this at depth. So yeah. yeah we have, uh, thanks for the, for the presentation, Joel. Uh, we got quite a lot of people you know, asking questions while you were presenting. I've compiled some nice ones over here and I'll post them on the screens as well. So the first one is, uh, you know, can you mention some of the key benefits because you mentioned web scraping. So what are some of the key benefits of using headless routers rather than traditional methods? Or let's say if I'm using, um, you know, like manual proxies or whatever and manually scraping the websites. That's what I have done in the past. Like I did some tutorials and stuff and I was teaching web dev and I was like, okay, you can use proxy, you can add some delays and, you know, using Selenium and stuff. and Oh, there's other thing called beautiful soup. Uh, so, so many. Yep. So, how is headless browsers like? What are some other key benefits if you want to summarize? Yeah, so there's a lot of benefits. Um, the first is if you're dealing with the site. So, I was writing an app a long time ago that just did like a, a wish list. And so, people could submit links to like a site for or links to products they want for like their birthday or for a holiday. And it collected, you know, the pricing information, the picture, and that. And so that way you could share it with family members and you know everybody has like a consolidated wish list. Well, I, I came to the point where Target wasn't working properly. Target.com at the time was a single page app, which means if you just did a, a raw curl, a raw fetch request to a link on Target's website, you just get this like HTML template. There was no product information. There was no images, nothing, no pricing, any of that. What happens is when a user goes to that website, the browser loads a bunch of other requests and then finally gets the data it needs to render the page. So the first is for this is that using a web browser will always act like a user does when they visit a website. So it loads JavaScript, it loads all these location details, it loads whatever it needs to do to render a page. So that is the first benefit I would say is that you are using the internet like it's used by most people today. Most people today don't do fetch calls. Most people today don't do API calls to get data. They open up a web browser and that's kind of the assumption that a lot of these large sites use is that you're gonna visit them through a web browser and there's gonna be things that get enhanced on the page later. Um, the second one, and this is one another one I don't really see too often, is you know the sites or the apps that you mentioned like Beautiful Soup, Cheerio for Node, they let you do some like DOM processing on the server side. But if you're using a live web browser, and we've done this before actually when we've like put together documentation, you can inject libraries into that site, into the JavaScript runtime on the web browser, and you know, use things like jQuery, which has a really nice you know, DOM selector API and DOM traversal API. Um, you can also watch network requests too as well. So like if you, the data you need comes from a network request from the browser, you can just watch those requests go by until you see the one that you need and grab data from that. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to using a web browser. It's not always going to be the case that you want to. It's obviously faster, a lot less resource intense to just do curl or fetch, get calls, you know, whatever your language and library supports. But for like the best, like most like bulletproof is what I say, way of traversing the internet, like using a web browser is the best. Um, and it, and it can be better too. You can do all sorts of things like reject image requests, you can reject CSS requests, because you know, for the most part, our scripts don't need to load images, they don't need to load CSS, they just need to load the page and maybe run some JavaScript and they get the data they need. So um, yeah, that's, those are the chief benefits, I'd say. Yeah, thanks for sharing, uh, Julian. When we talk about like, since we're talking about scraping and stuff, sometimes you have some use cases where you would want to, let's say, mimic a 
like how a user is going to interact with your websites or your application. So synthetic testing, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So traditionally, like when it comes to these sorts of tests, first of all, what do you think are some of the common challenges that people face? And do you think like headless browsers address these challenges? Yeah, so the big challenges I see, I mean, there's tech technology challenges, right? So if you've ever done like React testing with Storybook or others, a lot of that runs in a server environment and they mock the actual like JavaScript APIs in the browser to kind of get you as close as possible to looking like you're in a browser. And once you actually incorporate a headless browser into your test, it just becomes a lot easier. And you can do even cooler things like uh, server-side rendering if you wanted to without having to implement server-side rendering for React and you know, technologies like that. Um, having a headless browser means you are literally interacting with a browser. And even though it's headless, it just means that it's not, I think I saw a question actually earlier, like what's a headless browser mean? So a headless browser is a browser that's running, it's just not drawing to a screen somewhere. So it's headless in that sense. So having a headless browser means you have the actual same browsing experience, especially with headless Chrome that, you know, we as users use. So all of the DOM APIs are there. So if you're doing like a React app that you need to test, that's like doing Canvas stuff or is making a whole bunch of like, you know, web RTC calls, you don't have to worry about or setting up all this mocking infrastructure in your tests. You can just re rely on the fact that, hey, we're using headless Chrome. All those APIs are going to be there. So you don't have to worry about trying to make a fake environment for those tests to run. Um, the trick there is that, again, with any other headless Chrome challenges, is like you got to scale that at a certain point and make it go fast. And the uh, best way of doing that is just running a huge fleet of headless Chrome instances and just you know load balancing traffic amongst them. And do you think, like, just to follow up on the previous question, there are any specific, like, scenarios in which when we talk about synthetic testing with the headless browsers is like particularly valuable. Yeah, I think so. We use them internally at Browserless for what I call mission critical workflows. Hopefully, this is answering your question. Uh, but you know, the ones that like always need to work, like sign up. If signups aren't working on, on a PR, then obviously that needs to get fixed or changed. So we use that for um, production like critical workflows and they actually use production data to a certain extent. And so that validates everything is working top to bottom in production and is as close to our users, you know, how they interact with the service as well. And it's almost one-to-one. -one. So you can have some assurances that, hey, if this test passed, it's literally the same thing that a user goes through when they sign up. So, um, but it, you know, there's a lot of details that you can get into on that. It really depends on the organization you work at. Um, it depends on, you know, do you have the ability to test like those tests with production data or not? You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff, you, you know, there's networks, there's APIs, there's, you know, page differences that if you're using like mock data or sample data. Um, yeah, this is a whole nother session we could dive into about that because I've definitely lived and breathed through this as well. Um, so. But yeah, I'd say, you know, mission critical workflows, like signing up, upgrading plans, like the things, the just the website even loading, use a headless browser for that because it's going to be exactly what your users use. Amazing. Thanks for sharing. And uh, there's one question on the screen. Some, somebody's asking, you can read that while I scroll through the other ones. Yeah, sure. So. This is a great question. And this one has been a thorn in everybody's side. So like the question, you know, mostly centers around inspecting elements to get selectors, like the class name. So if you're writing code that does any sort of like, it's a website you don't own, let's say, let, let's dive into the scraping use case. So, you know, they, this, you know, don't, we don't want to have to like manually load the page up and look at the selectors. Um, you know, you have to have somebody involved to figure this out. So there's two strategies I would use for this. The, or, I mean, this question seems to be like two phases. The first is like, how do you start writing these kind of scripts without having to spend a lot of time looking at dev tools, looking at markup, all that. And the second part of this is, you know, 
what if the site changes or what if, you know, it was working and then all of a sudden it stops working? How do you like remedy that quickly? Let's talk about the first part and let's get into the second part here in a minute. So the first part being, how do I write code that does this initially? Um, Playwright and Selenium had this at one point too. I'm not sure if it's still around, but there was like a Selenium, like automatic generation code gen um, for writing Selenium code. But Playwright has, in my opinion, the best in class so far to do this. Um, there is a, a bunch of like integration into VS code. It'll launch the browser. It'll capture you interacting with the browser. It'll write the code for you. And it has a pretty sophisticated like DOM selector uh, engine that will look at what you're clicking, look at your typing, and it kind of knows how to rank those. So if it sees like an ID, it'll probably give ID, uh, like a DOM attribute ID higher um, priority than, you know, a class name, for instance, because class names can kind of change over time and they, you know, lose their, you know, most of they get changed or they get moved around or something happens differently. Playwright sees a lot of these, like the Playwright team does. And so they know, oh yeah, let's target these other ones in favor of these other DOM attributes. If you've ever done any sort of scraping, you'll know that like there's a million ways to target a piece of text on a website or an image or data on it. Um, and so, yeah, the Playwright tooling is great. Um, at the browser conference, we had somebody show this live and it was, it was amazing. Like he, in like two minutes had this like 200 line test that like ran flawlessly. Um, so anyways, that's the first thing is like, find good tools that like automate that or, you know, remove that from your day-to-day -day workflow. Playwright is, you know, in my opinion, the best one. Um, but every set of tools out there has, it. it's just a problem of like, you got to find them. Um, so yeah, Playwright, VS Code extension for Playwright and just use it. it. It works out of the box really well for testing and probably even for scraping, to be honest. Um, the second thing is, is, oh crud, like I had this thing working and now it's not working. This is something that Playwright doesn't do, but I think more people should start thinking about it in, in this sort of way is usually if you have like, let's say like the case is you want to go to a website and click on a button. Most people will write, you know, page go to site, button click, some selector. That's fine if that selector is on the page. The problem is, is that selector changes if it moves and you have a selector that's like based on where it's at on the page. So I almost always, every time will write more than one selector for an element. So what does that mean? So instead of doing like, you know, dot sign up link selector, I'd write, you know, dot sign up link selector. If that's there, click it. If it's not there, look for this other selector. Okay, that's there, click it. If it's not that one, look at this other one and click it. So it's like trying to find the best case uh, or the, you know, I guess for every element on the page, it's looking for multiple ways to target that element. So it looks for IDs, it'll look for selectors, it'll look for, you know, relative to other things on the page. So instead of just having like one thing to rely on, you're relying on like three to four to five things. So if one of them isn't there, then there's a good chance that maybe another one is there. My personal favorite, if you wanted to ask me my personal favorite for, you know, what, how do I select something in a general sense that just usually just works? Look for um, some of the, um, how are those called? Like the uh, APIs that help with um, folks that, you know, are using screen readers, right? So you'll have particular screen reader API selectors and those almost always never change, right? So if you have like a username field, it'll have a, um, a selector on it that says, hey, screen reader, you know, this is the username field that'll never change because they don't want to break screen readers, you know, for people with disabilities. And so those almost always never change. Um, and so I would say, you know, use those. Those are always a good bet because they'll never move around. The other thing that I've seen that works out pretty well is a lot of uh, engineering companies will put like data attribute, like data test dash something. So they have automated tests that they're running. And there are those automated tests. They don't want to change every time the DOM changes. So they'll put something in the DOM that always corresponds to some like form element or a button element or, you know, click element. And it'll always be like data test or data something, you know, automation or data QA. Those are always good because they will never change. 
Uh, they might move a little bit on the page, but it's always generally going to be the same selector. Those are a good one to target for scraping use cases as well. Um, the last one that I like to do, sorry, this is kind of moving over to like <laughs> the, the best tips and tricks for hacks for scraping. Um, is a lot of the meta stuff. So if you think about like OG images, OG URLs, OG price, like Facebook, Twitter, all those have like a meta tag on the page. Always look for those first because those are going to be right there. They want like Twitter, Google, all those to be available. So they'll put them right in the meta tag on the page. So if you're looking for the price, look at the meta tags. Don't look through the DOMs stuff. Look at the meta tag because that's what they want to get indexed by. And so if you're wanting to just grab price and a picture, Look at the meta. They're probably in meta tags at the head of the document. So, um, yeah. So, anyways, I hope that it helps a little bit and answer that question. That's a that's a tough one. It, it also just depends on the culture of the company you work at, too. Culture is a big part of, you know, how this works at scale for your business or your, your you know, engineering team. Um, and they usually, most companies I've noticed will have their, like, own homegrown tool, which is good and bad and for various reasons. But, um yeah, you know, try to use whatever strategies yeah. they've used. I think I think that's a good point. But uh, a follow-up question I have is like, when I'm scraping data, and let's say I'm making some personal projects and stuff, that is okay. It's like no no biggie. Uh, but how do you you know how do folks and in your experience, how do you see engineers ensure that you know it's, let's say if you're using uh, because we're talking about headless browser, so you have your automation scripts and stuff like that, and let's say let's say the you know websites and the web applications are like evolving so how do you remain robust and like adapt to that change as time goes by does it ever become like redundant or like what are some of the best practices uh when you know things keep changing or evolving yeah so that is a great question um i don't want to equate it to like a self-driving car but it really starts to become that level of problem, right? Like if you give, given a giant blog of HTML text, you know, find the price. So let me tell you about a few novel ways I've seen that solved and by some people and some, and some libraries that are attempting to do this in kind of a new novel way. The first is computer vision. So instead of doing DOM traversal, looking at markup and looking at like raw text on the page, which is usually a pretty, pretty good way of doing it. What folks will instead do is they'll take a screenshot of the whole page and then they can track not only visual changes over time, but you can also get, you know, machine learning, other like AI platforms to look at that and tell you like, oh, yeah, if you're looking for price, there it is. The price is blah, 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 because I can see it just like how we as people would, you know, consume web server. We look at it. We don't read text on the markup. We actually like look at the page and see where it is. So that's a pretty sophisticated way of doing scraping that's probably where the industry is going to go at a certain point the problem is, is there's just not a lot of libraries out there that support that in open source it's very behind closed doors um, i've seen it a lot with our user base and browser lists is they literally just take screenshots they don't care about evaluating elements on the page or getting text back it's literally snapshot we'll put this in our ml pipeline and it'll find it uh, the second kind of novel one is heap. Um, I think this was on Hacker News at one point. So there's a way that, you know, in the JavaScript runtime, it'll keep a heap of memory of what's going on in the page. And more often than not, what the information you're looking for is in heap. It's in the memory that that page is used. And that is a very more, much more straightforward process than doing, you know, selectors, DOM, traversal, all that. It's a little harder to do at scale and I haven't, we don't, haven't written a good like blog on how to do it just yet. Cause the, the original genesis of this idea was a little messy with how you like would actually do this, but it worked really well. Um, but essentially it's using the JavaScript runtime heap to look at and inspect what's going on inside of the page and finding the information you need in heap, which is, it's crazy. Um, so that's another good one. I should dig up the link for that because I think it's a pretty interesting, uh, case yeah, again, but. Uh... I'll leave the links in the description below. I think we will run out of time, but the questions won't stop. Uh, we have plenty, so we can see how many we can answer before the time runs out, which is in 10 minutes, uh, because we want to have to be cautious of everyone's and Joel's time as well. Uh, <laughs> all right, there's one over here. 
This is an interesting question. Can we use browserless to automate cloud operations like regular day-to-day -day jobs, Jira and stuff, since the browser is the only gateway to use these things? Yes, <laughs> yes is definitely the answer. That's actually a big one is automating platforms that we that you don't own or don't have like a REST API. So like if you wanted to mark or close the sprint automatically in Jira, let's say like, yeah, that's very easy to do. Jira is a great one because their markup rarely ever changes over time. It's been the same practically since I was doing it. Um, so yeah, that that's a great way of automating something that doesn't have a REST API. And actually we get a lot of folks just trying to do that. Like, hey, I wanna work on this, automate this, uh, like health insurance is a great example. Health, most health insurance companies in the US don't have an API, but if you get a new employee on board, at your business, they got to get into the system. Um, and so this is a great way of like automating that. Headless browsers are always a good way of doing that. Because again, it's just like your user would do it. It's just you're writing code that does it automatically. Um, so yeah, I would say for sure, 100%, I would definitely use like Puppeteer, Playwright, any of those libraries to automate a use case where they don't have an API. Sorry, I thought there was another one you had there that was pretty interesting. I wanted to dive into, but yeah, I know we're we're, we're close to time. We're at that time. <laughs> no, I think I think you I think you answered it like it was a similar question, so like around cloud applications. But anyway, um, you can connect with Joel as well. You can join the browserless community if you want to have if you have any other further questions. Let's do one last question, which is an interesting one because it's about security. So, are there any security considerations? You know, when you're using headless browsers for automation specifically in like sensitive environments? Yeah, I mean, the great thing is Chrome is pretty good about automating that aspect. So anytime Chrome runs and starts up, it creates a temporary data directory for its session. So that's where everything gets stored. It, you know, all your cookies, your local storage, caches, all get stored in this file locally. All of us have it right now, believe it or not. Um, and so Puppeteer does automate deleting that when the session is done. So you just want to make sure that things get cleaned up properly at the end of your session. And again, Puppeteer most of the time does that automatically. But if you run a session and it crashes, that file is still there somewhere in your file system. So you have to be cautious of things like that. So for instance, Browserless makes its own temporary data directory. And if Puppeteer crashes or the Chrome process crashes, we have code that will automatically go and remove it. Um, in terms of other types of securities, yeah, obviously if you're dealing with usernames and passwords and you're having that go through Puppeteer, just be very careful that you're not sharing that in any way into the browser's runtime environment. Um, think things like cross-site scripting, you know, those same like basic concepts can still be used. You know, websites can check, hey, is Puppeteer injecting something into my page and, you know, pull information out. Um, yeah, so those are, those are definitely things to consider is like, you know, be careful what you're putting into the web browser when you're automating it and be careful about what the web browser does at the end of the day when it's done. So in the case of Chrome, it's this user data directory that you have to make sure is gone. Amazing, well, that was it. And uh, thanks a lot for sharing and getting some shout outs. Really appreciate it. But yeah, like Joel mentioned, um, all the links for the you know, resources and stuff that were discussed during this session. You can find those, find these in the description below, including including browserless as well. But yeah, try it out and um, have fun. And if you have any other questions, you can join the browserless community. Again, links in the description. But uh, thanks a lot for watching and asking all the nice questions. Really appreciate you all giving the time. Thanks, Joel, for your join as well. Nice presentation and to answer all the questions patiently. Yeah, see you in the next one. Yep. Thanks, Kanal. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Bye.